Well, at the dawn of this day, I'd like you to welcome Professor Meshulam. <laughs> Professor Meshulam comes to us from Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and he needs no further introduction from me. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. There's your clock, sir. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, to be with uh, friends uh, is always a pleasure, and uh, I hope that we shall have a very pleasant meeting. Just um, uh, one sentence. Uh, I enjoyed what you said, Al. But, um, you know, for uh, somebody coming from abroad, for a foreigner, you Americans like to whip yourself too much. Uh, after all, uh, obviously, well, you have uh, uh, positive guys and negative guys, uh, but let's not forget that the U.S. is paying more for legitimate uh, cannabis research than all the other countries in the world put together. And uh, much of what we know today on cannabis, as well as on just about uh, every medical subject, is being paid by you, by the uh, uh, NIH, uh, in, in my case, uh, NIDA and so on. So uh, don't whip yourself too much. I mean, there is uh, enough, uh, uh, there are enough bad things in every place. Certainly, I would assume in this one as well. But uh, let's try to, to, give, to be in, in relative proportions. Well, I'm not a politician. Um, I will be speaking on three topics. I thought at first I'll give a general a uh, historical introduction, but then looking um, two minutes ago at uh, uh, the program, I saw that a teacher is going to give a um, lecture just after me on holistic biochemistry over a few years, and I think that uh, I'll skip that, just give you a few, make a few remarks, and then go on to inflammation, which is much more important than just having a scratch Nowadays, it seems that inflammation is being uh, looked into in neurodegenerative diseases, in uh, uh, cardiac diseases, and so on. So it's a very, very central point in medicine. And uh, then I'll speak about uh, neuroprotection. We are talking about something, about cannabis, that has been used for several thousand years. These are one of the few uh, very old remaining uh, uh, records, <coughs> clay tablets, and that's why they remained around in the Middle East, because they were, put, they were written on clay tablets. And the Assyrians, uh, about 3,000, 3,500 years ago, left us those clay tablets, which they more or less mentioned what uh, we know today, namely that uh, uh, the drug uh, is one that takes away the mind, and that's the Ganzi Gunnu. They named not the plant, but they named the action. They named Azalu, the same plant uh, uh, used for neurological diseases, and the same plant under a third name used in religious rites. So it's not that different from what we know uh, today. Then if we skip uh, a few thousand years, then we see that the Romans, and the Greeks actually, um, and the Romans knew uh, quite a bit. And I took out something on... Uh, on um, inflammation alone, and Dioscorides, of course, is the father of most of the medicine that was used in Europe uh, for about 2,000 years. And um, then if we skip another uh, 1,000 years, or 2,000 years, then I took a few uh, citations from uh, literature in the UK, and you s they were pretty good physicians, although they didn't have much to work with. Uh, they spoke about infl inflammations one way or the other, and Russell Reynolds, who was the, uh, a physician of Queen Victoria, and apparently gave her cannabis for her uh, migraine. In England, they call it migraine, not migraine. Uh, and he was very happy with it, but here I took only one that has to do with, uh, uh, with pain. Uh, but uh, uh, let's not forget that we're dealing with 19th century England. In, indeed, uh, the same Russell Reynolds writes in one of his papers, uh, but many of my colleagues prefer cannabis. Many of my colleagues prefer Dr. Hughes' favorite and useful remedy, 
rhubarb steeped in wine. So um, it was not that widely used. In any case, for about, uh, oh, let's say about a century, little was known uh, medically about cannabis on a real basis. And this is a little bit strange because morphine had been isolated from, from opium uh, the early 19th century. And the reason why medicine or uh, the medical literature uh, on cannabis uh, was uh, lagged behind um, was because the active component couldn't be isolated or the active components and very little significant research can be done with mixtures that change their contents uh, every so often. So uh, there was little known, although uh, there some very uh, uh, good work was done both in the UK and in the US, in the US uh, by uh, 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 several uh, uh, laboratories, and in the UK by um, Lord Todd, who got very close to uh, finding the actual uh, active component, but unfortunately the methods that were being used were not sufficiently developed in that time, and therefore the uh, uh, field remained uh, in stagnation for uh, uh, quite a few, uh, few years more. Uh, in the early 60s, uh, we were able to get uh, quite a lot of hashish from the police. You know, working in a small country, it's uh, sometimes useful. You call the uh, head of the, uh, the police and say, ah, hello, you remember we were uh, together at, uh, I don't know, somewhere. Uh, can you give me five kilos of hashish? I want to do some work on it. <laughs> and uh, he called the head of my institute and said, can we depend on him? The fellow said, oh yes, oh yes, I was a very, very young fellow at that time, just had come back from the Rockefeller Institute in New York doing some work on natural products. He said, sure. Okay, let him come over and f pick up five kilos of uh, good, good hashish. Then it turned out that both he, the head of police, and me, we had broken just about every law the Ministry of Health was making at first, but again, uh, they uh, signed a letter saying, okay, don't do it again, just you should get it from us, and I've been getting it from them ever since. But in any case, we looked at the contents of cannabis, of hashish, hash is uh, uh, much more potent uh, than marijuana. And we were able over the next few years to isolate about a dozen uh, cannabis constituent. Now there are about 60 of them. More, m most of them, all of them actually, are based on the same type of skeleton. S those that you can see here, they have two parts. One part is an aromatic ring, for those of you who remember your <laughs> chemistry and the part of it is terpenes. And uh, there are lots of variations. And all of the 60 cannabinoids, including the first five of the uh, ten that we isolated, are based on the same principle. Surprisingly, uh, only one compound turned out to be, uh, uh, to be psychotropic, to cause psychotropic effects, which are typical for cannabinoids. But before I go on, I want to show a few compounds, acids, cannabinoid acids, which are present in the plant more than that present in, in dried marijuana or dried hashish because they, they change, they decarboxylate, uh, and uh, they turn into THC or in cannabidiol. But these compounds, they have, people have not looked into them. These compounds are uh, potent anti-inflammatory agents, and they have no uh, CNS activity to the best of my knowledge, and nobody has looked into them since we published their, since we isolated and published their structures uh, many, many years ago, I wouldn't tell you when, don't want to look that ancient, but uh, uh, we published them, we looked, and so did the anti-inflammatory, as a matter of fact, we tried to look into the literature, and it turned out that um, a Czech group in uh, one of the small Czech towns in, in Bohemia had a mixture of these compounds in their hands in the early, in the late 40s and were using them as an anti-inflammatory mixture for mm, uh, inflammations in ho uh, on horses. They were just putting the mixture on and horses and then the inflammation uh, just disappeared. Nobody has looked into them since. 